So look with me there in chapter 26 in verse number 1. And the first thing that I want you to see as we deal with chapter 26 is the perfect peace of God. The perfect peace of God. I know over the last few days you've heard about our president and how he's been working with the Arab nations and how there's a, a peace treaty that's been signed uh, with, with several different groups in Israel. Uh, something that folks have been working towards some time and haven't been able to pull it off. And over the last few days that's been able to happen. Uh, but understand that even though they may say peace and they may say working together, there will never be real Real peace until Jesus returns. That's the only way that there can be perfect peace. And when Jesus returns, when he comes there for that battle of Armageddon, and he remains here on this earth for that thousand-year millennial reign, throughout that time there will be perfect peace on this earth. And the reason that there will be perfect peace is because we will have a righteous king on the throne, and his name will be Jesus Christ. And so when we're talking about chapter 26, it starts off with those three words. Look right there at the beginning. It says, in that day. In that day, the song will be sung in the land of Judah. So the thing that we're about to study and make our way through, it's a song. It's a song that's sung that goes through several different parts, and it has different kind of themes as it makes its way through there. But it's just a song that, that's being sung. It's a song of joy. It's also a song of judgment. It's a song of happiness because of, of, of Jesus Christ at the end of it. And we'll get there in just a few minutes. But it is a song that's being sung. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Now there's a lot of parts in there that make reference to other places in the Bible, whether it be the book of Revelation, whether it be by Isaiah, whether it be in Daniel. There's different things that matches up with other parts of the Bible. And you've heard us say before that we have to look at the Bible as a whole. And by looking at the Bible as a whole, we're able to keep the Word of God in context. We should never just grab one word, one sentence out of this and, and try to figure out what that says. But we compare it to the rest of Scripture. For example, when it begins by talking about this singing, this joyful, a day of joyful singing there in verse number 1, Isaiah chapter 35. And verse number 10 says this, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy. Upon their heads, they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and, sh and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. It's just talking about the same things, and it even says there about about not only the the songs, but the everlasting joy that we just read as we were working through the scripture. Not only that, but it says that he he sets up salvation. There in verse number 1, he sets up salvation in Isaiah chapter 52, beginning in verse number 7 and working through to verse number 10, it says this, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who, pub who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. You know that song we sing sometimes? Our God reigns. You know that? You know it comes right out of the Bible, right? <laughs> a lot of the stuff, in fact, about everything that we sing comes right out of the Scripture. We're just singing what God's already given us in order to glorify and honor Him. But it goes on. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice together. They sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. You see the return of the Lord, the reign of Christ, and how He brings the kingdom of God. Break forth together in to singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. You see, the thing is, we have salvation is available to the whole world right now. Right now. But one day the door is going to be shut. Kind of like in the days of Noah. Do you remember the story of Noah? The ark was built over 120 years. 
And then there was a day when the rains came. And the people throughout that whole time, Noah was preaching the word of God through the Holy Spirit was preaching through him to the people. And he's saying, repent, repent, repent. Here's a boat. But for 120 years, they looked at him like a fool. But then the rains came. And they didn't look at him that way anymore. But see, here's the problem. When the rains came, the Bible says, and the Lord shut the door. Noah didn't reach out to that door and pull it closed and seal it shut, but it's what God did. But they had 120 years. 120 years to repent. But there ended up only being eight people on that ark. Just eight. Imagine the number of people who knew about it. You see, Jesus Christ has set up salvation. And it's available to the whole world right now. It's available to our whole church. You know, there are Sundays when when I'm up here leading worship or I'm up here sharing the Word of God and I look out into our congregation and I look at faces. And as I look at faces, there's this question that comes into my heart. And that question is, is, do they know Jesus Christ? That's the question. And I can't get it out. All I do is I see the face and the question comes inside of me. And it causes you to preach hard. It causes you to sing hard. And it causes you to lead in a certain way so that they will know that what you're singing about is real and true and right. And so that they know that the word of God that's being preached in that very moment is being preached to them. So that they would know that salvation has been brought to us through Jesus Christ and is free. The horrible thing is many people come into our churches on Sundays and they leave as lost as they were when they came in. It's sad. It's sad. You see, Jesus sets up the salvation. He did in the Old Testament. He did in the New Testament. There it is. It's free for us. But not only that, in verse number 3, He keeps us in perfect peace. He keeps us in perfect peace. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 7 says this, Of the increase of His government and of the peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. He will keep us in perfect peace. You see, when he comes, there will be peace like we have never known because of a righteous judge ruling over us. The last thing that I see here in these first four verses is the fact that he is an everlasting rock. He's an everlasting rock. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 9 it says this, I saw in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. You see, it's his. It's his. And he is an everlasting God. Not only do I see uh, the perfect peace of God when I look at this text, but I also look at the provision, the provision of a coming Savior. The provision of a coming Savior. Look look at verse number 5. It says, For he was humbled, the inhabitants of the height, the lofty city. He lays it low, he lays it low to the ground. Cast it to the dust. The foot tramples it, the feet of the poor, and the steps of the needy. But look at verse 7. But the paths of the righteous is level. You make level the way of the righteous. Who is you? That would be our Lord. He makes level the way of the righteous. When we look at this in verses 5 through 7, we recognize who He is. 
And it goes right along with chapter 25 and verse number 3. When it says these two things, it says, The strong will glorify you. The ruthless nations will fear you. It's the same thing. It's, it's like a, a, a type of compare and contrast. When you look at the, the first few verses, the first verses 5 and 6, you see the unrighteous. But when you compare it to verse number 7, you see the righteousness of God in the people in which he's created. In verses 5 through 6, there's the lofty. The self-worshippers, the, the pious, the unrighteous before Christ. And it says they will be humbled, they will be laid low, and they'll be trampled underfoot, both by the poor and the needy, all those who were all high and lifted up throughout their whole life will be trampled underfoot. But then there are the righteous. In verse number 7, in the ESV, it says, The path of the righteous is level. You make level the way of the righteous. I also like the King James Version. If some of you have that version, it says, The way of the just is uprightness. I love that. It's kind of like something like I would have heard Jerry Clower say. Uprightness. You know, and it says, Thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. That just sounds awesome. That's what our God does. He weighs the path of the just. It's like he just balances it out. And that's exactly what it's talking about. Our way is straight. It is even. It is level. It is right because it's the way of God. That's what this is saying. And not only that, but God balances. He levels it. He weighs the way those justify and that are vindicated by God. Reminds me of Psalm chapter 91 and verses 1 through 3 where it says this. Some of my most favorite verses in scripture. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Doesn't that sound just amazing? Just abiding in the shadow of God. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, you're my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Wow. That is our Lord. That's verse 7. He balances it out. When I think about the provision of our coming Savior, I'm reminded of the protection that every single one of us receive every day, and often we're not even thankful for it. I can remember when I was young, I had just began working with my dad. It had been just, just a couple of years, a couple of summers, and we were on this house. It was my dad's house. It was really high off the ground. We're on the second level, and, and the day before we had gone through, we had laid plywood. We had our, it's a 12, it's very steep. I'm about to tell you the pitch. That's not going to help you. <laughs> it's very, it was very steep. And so we had these things called tow boards that we nailed to the plywood so we could stay on the pitch of the roof. But we got down through there and we ran out of plywood. And so in this one space where it was going to go out over the garage, we went ahead and felt it over it so that the rain wouldn't get on the plywood on the floor. You know what I did the very next day? I sure did. I walked right across those tow boards, just making my way, and I took a step with my right foot, but it didn't stop, and it kept going. And all I could remember in that moment was, I've got to grab hold to something. And as I fell down, I fell backwards, and my feet went down, but my body went off the side of the house, and it was up there. And about that time, my mama came around the other side of the house and she saw me hanging upside down with my feet hooked underneath the rafters. You know what she said to my dad? She said, Skip, get that boy down off that house. Just like that. <laughs> Protection of God. Just one, one moment from injury. Just one. But God. But God. It's the only reason. But God. 
You see, not only is he a provision of safety, not only can he give that provision, but he can also give courage when we're in need of that in order to do the very thing that he's called us to do in order to be within God's will for our life. There's been those times when I've been in an aircraft, craft, I would sit underneath the, the transmission of, of the helicopter and flying this, to go and, 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 and drop off people, I would sit facing forward. But then after we went and dropped them off, we'd go somewhere, we'd park until the mission was done. I would flip the seat over, and I would ride backwards with a medical case underneath me, just in case a soldier got back on the aircraft and they didn't leave, they didn't come back in the same condition in which they left in. And I can remember the, the, the pilot coming over the radio in my helmet, and he said, Chaplain, listen, we're about to go pick these guys up, and you just need to start praying right now. Because we're going right back to where we dropped them off at. And we never do that. Because the place where we dropped them off at is where the enemy will be. And you need to pray, chaplain. Just like that. Oh, the moments when we need trust in our life. That we just trust God because he's put us in a particular situation in order to do what he's told us to do. And you just need that provision. You see, our God, he, he gives provision through our coming Savior. We've got it. It's right there. But we have to place our trust, all our hope, all of our assurance in Jesus Christ and Him alone. We, can, we can't think that we could ever do it on our own. But we have to trust God. Thirdly, there's a genuine passion for God. When you look at this text and when you get down to verse number 8, you can't help, help but see that there in verses number 8 and number 9. It's genuine passion for Jesus Christ. It says, in the path of your judgments, O Lord, we wait for you. Your name and remembrance are the desire of our soul. My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I, I lay down at night to go to sleep, but my, my soul, it yearns for you, Jesus, in the night. What does it mean to say, That you are the, the desire of my soul. What does that mean? What does it mean to say, I yearn? I mean, I really yearn. As I, as I studied that and I thought through it and I looked at all the other words that mean yearn, there was just tears that came to my eyes. Because it made me question my own heart. Do I yearn? I mean, really yearn for Jesus. Do we yearn? You know, as I look through examples in the Word of God of different people who had genuine passion for God, there were several people that came to mind. In Acts chapter 5, we talked about it this morning in our men's breakfast. If you're not a part of that, you're just messing up. That's all I got to say. Acts chapter 5, Peter and the apostles, they were so close to God preaching and living out Jesus Christ before the church that in Acts chapter 5 and verse 16, it says that the multitudes gathered from surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing the sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were healed. People with, with genuine passion for God are different they're real. You see, when the other people from, from there to Jerusalem, they looked and they saw these guys and they said, they've got something that we need. And one of those things were healing. Did you know that at least one person in that text said, if I can just be in the shadow of Peter, I can have healing. That's amazing, but it's a genuine passion that he had for God. It was genuine. It was real. It was who he was. There was no mistaking it. Acts chapter 5 and verse 41, it, they got in trouble with the Sadducees because of their faith. 
And then they left the presence of the council to see the Sadducees got them, and, and they brought them before this council basically to judge them. And then when they finally got to leave, it says they left the council rejoicing. Rejoicing for what? Look at this. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer. That's genuine passion. That's real. Have you ever woke up in the morning and during your prayer said that to God? God, I pray that I am worthy to suffer for you today. You ever said that? Oh my. Genuine passion. Genuine. It's real passion. You see, you see, these they celebrated, they rejoiced to be counted worthy to suffer. That's genuine passion. In Acts chapter 16, you've read this story before. We've talked about it many times within the walls of this church, about Paul and Silas, how they had been beaten with rods. They'd been thrown in prison, and around their ankles were shackles. They were tied to a wall. And what does the Bible say that they did? Acts 16, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What in the world is wrong with them? They got stripes on their back, shackles on their feet, in prison, and what are they doing? Worshiping God. Praising God. Beating them, putting them in prison didn't change their love or their desire for Jesus. That's genuine passion. That's real in Daniel chapter 3, you know this story too. Three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember the story? How Nebuchadnezzar had built this, this idol, this statue of gold. And he says to these three men, Hey, look, you're going to bow down in it or you're going into the furnace. And what did they say? Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16. They answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, We have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, if you do this, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. We would rather die than serve any other god but our God. That's genuine passion. In Exodus chapter 33, there was a man named Moses. And he was in his tent. It was the tent of meeting where he would meet up with God and talk to him. And God would talk back. There was a cloud over it during the day and fire over it. During the night, all the people were afraid. And God would just speak to Moses there. And here's what God said in that tent to Moses. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. You have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. And Moses said in verse 18, Lord, please show me your glory. Now, how you, some of you are going, well, how is that genuine passion? Think about it. The guy gets to talk to God every single day, but it ain't enough. It ain't enough. Yes, I can hear you talking to me, God, and yes, I know you listen, and God, I know you favor me, but will you just let me see you? That's what he said. Would you let me see you? And as you know, God's reply if you see me, you will surely die because you wouldn't be able to handle it. Knowing God, being favored by God, speaking directly with God, it wasn't enough. And so I ask you tonight, as you think about genuine passion, how passionate are we about Jesus Christ? Really? Really? Fourthly, you see this. You see the pattern of the past. 
the pattern of the past as it relates to the Israelites. And I would say that it relates to us as well. When you look at this from the standpoint of looking backwards, the tribulation has already taken place. Look at verse number 16. O oh Lord, in distress they sought you. They poured out a whispered prayer when your discipline was on them. It's what we do. It really is. It's what the Israelites did. You see, we let go of God. We trust ourselves. We believe that we can do it without God. We worship other gods and, 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 and we forget the genuine passion that we once had. We look at the Israelites and say, why do y'all do that? And we do the very same thing. In Judges 10 and verse 7, it says, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the land of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites. But you see, with God, there's always another way. It's a way of repentance. You also see the prayer you see, they poured themselves out. They got real before God, and they said to God, please help, God, help. We've been there too. You remember those moments, the heaviness in your heart by the Holy Spirit? Maybe you feel that tonight. Just that heaviness that can only be brought, and you know it's God. It's there where we feel broken in the pain of our failure. It's there that we confess and we repent. And it's also right there where God is faithful. You see, if we confess, He is faithful to forgive us of our sin and trespasses. Judges 10, 15, and 16. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, We've sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you, only please deliver us. So they put away the foreign gods from among them, and they served the Lord, and he became impatient over the misery of Israel. They poured out. They got real. They got passionate about their Lord. The last thing that I want you to see there is the power of a mighty God. The power of a mighty God. Look with me at verse number 19. After all these things, and it, it works in order, it gets up to this verse where it says, And your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise, and, 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 and you will dwell in the dust, awake, and sing for joy. And there's an explanation point at the end of that. For your dew is the dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14 says this, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will, will not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. You see how it all just links right together. When you look at the Word of God, church, if you've lost your passion, today's the day. We've showed you how the people repent. I've explained to you how we repent and how God is faithful. If you've lost your passion, would you, before you leave this place tonight, confess that to God? Just be real. Just say to God, Lord, I've lost my passion. Restore me and give me the passion placed inside of me, God, the passion to serve you in the manner that you've created me to serve.